Get a jump start on collaborative learning. Welcome to What's Wrong with Corporate Training with Monica Cornetti. In this 90-minute interactive webinar, you'll learn how to, one, learn the most effective way to learn and develop a new skill or behavior. Two, flex your instructional style to positively impact the learning experience. Three, build a wider range of techniques to interest all learners, and finally, develop your trainer's toolbox to enhance the learning environment. Monica Cornetti is a highly sought after speaker because of her spunkiness and emphasis on fun while learning. She is the author of the forthcoming book, What Were You Thinking?, and the acclaimed book, Your Face Isn't Finished Until Your Lipstick Is On, Rules for the Women's Success Game. As a senior small business development specialist, Monica is the owner of EntrepreneurNow, a business training and consulting firm. She has more than 20 years experience in the corporate, nonprofit, and academic sectors with an expertise in bringing excellence to organizations through leadership and training. Monica is a graduate of Seton Hill with a BA in psychology and the University of Houston, Victoria, where she earned a master's degree in economic development and entrepreneurship. Monica has been designated one of the best entrepreneurial trainer, training experts and works with individuals and organizations who want to learn how to think differently to achieve different results. She has been featured on the cover of Bloomberg Business Week and her audiences from Guam to Georgia and Maui to Maine have given her perfect 10 reviews. You're about to learn and you're about to enjoy a wonderful webinar. Monica? Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, this, I'm so excited about this opportunity to present this webinar, What's Wrong with Corporate Training? And the reason I'm excited to introduce it and to present it to you today is because I've been able to, over this past 90 days, do so much research because I've been developing some curriculum for different clients and I've just had a complete mind shift on where training's going and what we as trainers and people who are responsible for developing and delivering training, what we should be looking at as we move into the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years. And the one thing that we know is that things work until they don't work anymore. So it's not that anyone who is listening to this call, is who is on the call, who's listening to the recording, has done anything wrong. That's not the point of the call. The point is, is that they, things worked until they didn't work anymore. And then when they're not working anymore, we have to see what we're going to do differently to achieve a better result. So I've been teaching my seminar on what's wrong with corporate training since 2008. I wrote a book, it's an activity guide book, and I recorded, went into studio and recorded a 60-minute audio CD on how to deliver totally awesome training in 2008. And the reason for that was because I was brought into an organization to enhance their training, and I realized that like so many other industries, this particular industry that I was involved with, was just missing quite a few things and it wasn't that they weren't wanting to get better at training it was just that they didn't have the tools to be able to do it so that's one of the reasons that we put together this webinar today and it started a few months ago when I got a call from a client who was interested in having me develop and deliver a program for them on gamification and I got to tell you that I did one of those really good uh, kind of bluff sessions. Have you ever done that where you just ask them questions and see what they were looking for because I really wasn't familiar with the term. I had seen some things recently come across my inbox and I hadn't really paid attention to it. So I got through the phone call, said, well, let me do, let me put some few thoughts together and I'll get back with you on it. And then I went out there and started researching heavily. And I know for some of you who are on the call and listening to the recording, you're the same way. It, when we talk about gamification, the, 
that, well, what's gamification? I'm not really familiar with that term, and that's okay. Because although the term's been around now for probably over 10 years, it just hasn't reached that tipping point yet where it's moved its way into human resources and training and development that it's become a common term. And you'll see it coming more and more, and we will reach that tipping point. And fortunately for you, because you're on this webinar, you'll be ahead of the game on it. You'll have already looked into it. You'll have done some research. You'll know companies that provide gamification tools that you can use. You'll also know that you can include gamification right now today in any of your training that you're doing without that technology because I'm going to show you all of that today. I'll be giving you examples and also some websites and companies where you can find additional information during the webinar today. So the first thing I want to do is let you know that we did a survey before the webinar and it was regarding a couple of things about corporate training and what's going on within organizations training. and just as a, a way to get the, go, the session started today, I just want to ask you, really, when you look at your training program, what do you see that is lacking? What's lacking about your training program or within your whole organization's training, what's lacking? And typically, when I ask clients, participants that question, I get things like, well, we really don't have any budget to work with. I'm not getting support from upper management. We're asked to deliver the same old, same old, same old information, even though we're not getting the results. A lot of people have difficulty getting their employees to attend the training that they're supposed to. Uh, things like how much of it is actually sticking, how much retention is there, and is there a way to evaluate the effect on corporate goals as a result of having attended the training. So those are some common answers that I get when I ask these questions. And your answers might be different. And I'm always looking to grow and learn and develop and add to my Totally Awesome training programs. So any thoughts that you have on this, I'm open to it. And I would love to hear from you. You can always send me an email at monica at monicacornetti.com. We're happy to have a discussion with you. We could do a Skype call. If, you're, if we're going to be in the same town, we can sit down and have coffee. The thing is, is that when we're looking at what's wrong with the training, it's not just to have some kind of gripe session. It's to think about thinking differently so that we can achieve a different result. Because if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you've always gotten. And when, if what you're getting isn't working anymore, then we've got to change what we're doing. The biggest challenge we have when changing what we're doing is that, and it's not anyone's fault, it's just the way it works, is that by the time you finish second grade, you have had a belief system in you that there is one right answer to every question. And it's just how the educational system has to work because we have to test to know that the students learned. In order to test, we have to have a right answer and wrong answers. And then we become adults, and as an adult, haven't you found that there is very seldom one right answer to any question that you have? So when we look at, well, how can we make our training better, we've identified, we're looking at what's wrong with corporate training, and we're identifying some of these factors, and well, what can we do differently? And unfortunately, there is no one right answer. And also, we kind of get stuck in the rut. I want to demonstrate that to you. So if I was to ask you about uh, drawing an alien, if we had the opportunity to go down to a planet that had not been discovered by human eyes before, and you saw in front of you an alien being, chances are the alien that you would draw would look like the alien that you see on the screen. It would have eyes and hands and some kind of mobility with the legs, some form of antennas. And you can do this activity in a training seminar and to prove the point. Just don't show the picture and ask people to draw an alien if they got to visit a planet that had been undiscovered. And you'll find that the participants' aliens look strangely similar to the people sitting around them. Now, why would that be? 
how could it be that on a planet that's been undiscovered, all of our aliens look alike? Well, it's because we know what aliens look like, right? You know what an alien looks like, don't you? You've seen movies. You've seen pictures. Uh, we've ever, ever since we've watched those old black and white movies of alien invasions, we know exactly what an alien looks like. So we've been conditioned to know what can't possibly be known. And that is what is going on back in our training also. We're conditioned to believe that it's got to be one way. It's got to be the way that people have said it's got to be since, you know, these the experts in the field who have studied and uh, development and learning and retention and stickability and whatever terms you want to put to it. And all of that is good and all of that is true. But what is true and what is a truth may not be the same thing. Because when we're looking at what's going to work today, chances are that it isn't what worked yesterday. And what's going to work tomorrow isn't what worked today. And as individuals who are responsible for getting the employees in an organization to a place where we're helping the organization achieve corporate objectives, we've got to be willing to break out of that alien mindset, the mindset that things can only look one way and be willing to explore what other options are out there because there is no one right answer to every question that's there. And in my research that I did this these past 90 days, I used a lot of different resources. One is a HR website called hr.blr.com. And uh, it has to do with like law research. It's a really great site. If you've not used it and you're an HR person, access it. The information is, uh, for the most part, free out there, hr.blr.com. And in a recent article from the site, they listed trends in corporate training that we'll see over the next decade. And I wanted to bring to you the top five trends that we're going to see in corporate training. And the first one is that employers are going to have to identify opportunities for employees to learn more and to be more proactive about their learning in areas such as health and wellness and ways to manage stress. Haven't you found that you're being asked to do more with less, as all employees are? And with that is coming a lot of stress issues as well as health and wellness issues. And so employee, employers are going to want employees to learn more about what they can do as individuals to manage their own wellness. The second trend is that employers will encourage attitudinal shifts. So they'll want employees to shift their attitude and basically change the way they think about how they view training. So when, they're, when employees are looking at training and development, employers are really going to encourage that they embrace training as part of lifelong learning, that what got them here isn't going to get them there. The things they know today aren't going to help them with the job tomorrow, and so that learning is part of everyday life. Unfortunately, there's lots of studies out there that show that a lot of employees don't want to learn. A good one by Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N, shows that about 55% of people in the workplace have no desire to get any better at their job. 55%, that's a heck of a lot of employees who have no uh, desire to train or to learn. Well, that's a pretty big shift that we need to have in their attitude. The third trend in corporate training is that the e-learning idea is that e-learning won't replace classroom training, but we will increase the focus on e-learning and ways that employees can get training just in short bites so that perhaps we're not going to do a long six, eight hour training or maybe even an hour training. Rather, we'll take it down to three, five, 10, 15 minutes where something they need to learn, they can go out there, they can watch a video, listen to an audio, and very quickly get the information they need and then get right back to work and apply it. So we'll be using e-learning to give that short bite learning 
And then also, trainers will need to identify and develop training that is adaptable. So for those of us who are on this webinar who are responsible for the development of training programs, we're going to make sure that as we're developing these programs that we'll be able to shift and adapt and easily uh, move into a different direction, that we don't become, that we're not creating a product, a a resource that's put into this binder that we treat it like it's a work of art, but rather that it's a work in progress because we will be needing to change it and adapt it to whatever the current needs are within the organization. And then the last one is to find ways to pass along the older workers' knowledge. And I'm sure most of you on the call have probably addressed this to some degree already. We have an aging workforce. And as that workforce approaches retirement, we need a way for them to pass along their knowledge to younger or less experienced workers. And we need a way for them to pass it on that the younger workers will accept it and embrace it. And that's one of the challenges that we see right now between the boomers and the X and Y generation is that the X and Y generation doesn't want to be told what to do and they want to be able to be a part of decision making and planning and implementation and the older worker knowledge is things that they need so somehow to meld the two of those together so that we can as seamlessly as possible continue with the growth and development of your organization what we're looking at today are some of the most effective training techniques and there are numerous methods and materials available to help you prepare and equip employees to do their job better. And haven't you found that with so many choices out there, it can be overwhelming to determine which method you should use and when you should use it. Now, when we look at the several methods, they some of them might be the most effective way to help employees learn and retain information and it depends on who you're working with. So let's take a closer look at the techniques and examine their advantages and their disadvantages and I'll also explain how you can combine the various methods into a very effective technique called blended learning. And in fact, reality is you're probably already using a blended learning technique, even if you haven't identified it as such. So before we decide which is the most effective way to help our employees learn and retain information, we've got to start with the basics. And so when we consider the development of a program, we have to look with the, at the basics. So what are your training goals? At this immediate time, I, I'm not saying to, to take a, you can take a step back and look at it in the whole picture, but if we're looking at development of individual programs, what is it you need to achieve from that program? Is it that you need your employees to develop new skills or some new techniques to apply to old skills? Or is it that there's some behaviors that need to change in the workplace? Or it might be that you're doing it so that you can provide a safer workplace or uh, a workplace that's free of discrimination and harassment. Whatever it is that is your objective, that's the first question we have to always ask in training. And I have a, a friend who, when we're talking about development of programs, that's the first question she always asks me. Well, what's your objective? What are you trying to achieve? And sometimes it frustrates the heck out of me, even when I know she's right, because I'm, I'm excited about the content, the information, and she's bringing me back to the main point. What is it you need to achieve? Doesn't matter how great your content is, if your content's not pointing you towards what you need to achieve. So that's the first thing we always have to start with. And then who's being trained? Because because that will help you to determine what is the best approach. So are these new employees, seasoned employees, upper management, the C team, are they younger employees, older employees? All those need to be taken into account. This next, the third element to consider, and it's the one that I know for most of us is the most difficult, is the training budget. 
I mean, how much do you really have to allocate toward any individual trainings? And I know sometimes you feel like you're asked to create these miracles with nothing. And haven't you found that oftentimes the best creativity from you comes when you have limited resources? I always say that necessity is the mother of all inventions. And whenever we don't have what we need, we got to figure out a way to make it happen. And it's amazing. Haven't you found that? What you can create when you don't have everything just handed to you. The last two things to consider is the time. How much time do you have for the training? And then what kind of resources and materials do you have at your disposal? And that could be anything from a training room to actual materials you can put into your participants' hands. Uh, if it's some kind of computer training, do you have enough of the computer uh, that the employees can get involved with it? All those things need to be considered. As you answer those questions, it'll help you to narrow down your training choices. So let me just recap them for you. What is your training goal? What's your objective? Who are you training? What's your training budget? How much time is allocated for this training? And what training resources and materials will you have for you to use? So with those five elements, you can then start considering what is the most effective way to help your employees learn and retain the information. So let's go through just a few of the options. These certainly, it's not an exhaustive list. I'm just going to give you some of the highlights and we'll look at how we can create those in a blended environment. The first one I want us to consider is a instructor-led training, a classroom environment. This type of environment remains one of the most popular training techniques for the trainer. It's personal, it's face-to-face, -face, uh, as opposed to some kind of computer-based training, and it ensures that everyone gets the same information at the same time. However, the downside to instructor-led train, instructor training, as I'm sure you've probably experienced, is that the success of the training depends on the effectiveness of the person delivering the training. So have you ever, as yourself, gone to a training, excited to go, wanting to learn, and then the person delivering the information was just couldn't get it across? I know that happened to me, and it was one of the catalysts for me to write my book on how to deliver totally awesome training and record the CD that I have. And I was working for an organization helping small business develop, helping small business owners develop their business plans so that they could take it to a lender and secure financing to either buy a business or to open a new business. And I had heard about this training where the banker was going to be able to tell us what exactly the bankers looked at or investors looked at on the financials, the pro forma documents that are included in a business plan, what lines they were looking at, what numbers they were looking at, and how they took those numbers and plugged those into formulas. And because it's just a matter of numbers, that once I knew what they were looking for and what the ratios had to be, I'd be able to sit down with my clients and better able to help them assess that whether they had a plan that was in all likelihood going to get financing or they were going to look, need to look for other sources or uh, get stronger in some areas before they'd be approved for financing. But I was so excited because I thought, oh my gosh, I have some clients right now that this will benefit. And when I went to the training, within the first 20 minutes, my only thought was, kill me now because if I have to sit here for the next six hours I'm going to be dead anyhow for the first 45 minutes all he did was talk about why he was qualified to be up there giving the presentation I don't care I already assumed he was qualified or he wouldn't be given the presentation and I didn't get although he was a subject matter expert I could not get the information. He didn't give it to us. So here's an example of somebody who was extremely qualified to be delivering the training, yet I don't think there was anyone in the room. And there were probably, I don't know, close to 100 people there who walked out with very much that they could choose. 
And have you had that happen? Have you perhaps been that subject matter expert at the front of the room? We hate to think of that, but sometimes as that subject matter expert, you know what the audience needs to know, and it's taken you a long time to get all that knowledge. You've put years into this. You have studied, you have researched, you have blood, sweat, and tears involved with it, and yet we try and convey all that information and fire hose the audience, and so they end up just soaking wet with nothing they can take home and retain. So we want to make sure that instructor-led training is effective. Here's the really cool thing. For boomers especially, instructor-led training is still the favorite type of training that they can receive. Studies show it time and time again for two reasons. One, they get to interact with their peers, and the second is they get a chance to have face-to-face -face time with the expert. So they still really look forward to this type of training. So to make sure that you're getting the most out of that, the audience has to be engaged throughout the session. So, and you can achieve that by training your trainers in the art and science of public speaking. There is an art and there's a science to it. Give your trainers the materials they need. Be sure your trainers know how to use interactive methods. And we'll come back to that a little bit more in detail. But since this is still a very popular way of learning, let's get the most bang for your buck out of it. Make sure that your trainers are not only subject matter experts, but that they're also trained in how to deliver the training. Now another type of training is uh, hands-on, and this can include cross-training, demonstrations, coaching, apprenticeships, drills. Hands-on training methods are effective for training in new procedures, new equipment. They allow trainers to immediately determine whether a trainee has learned the new skill or a procedure you're trying to teach. However, it can be expensive because you have to have both the skilled employee and the new employee working on one task. It can disrupt your productivity for that same reason, and you won't be able to generate as much because your skilled employee is being slowed down to help the new employee that they're training. However, the benefit for it is that you'll have that consistency across the board. So when you have those skilled employees who you want the newbies, the new people, the younger, no matter what the age, coming on to gain those same skills, this is the most effective way to have that happen. And I was a participant in this uh, kind of unknowingly recently, uh, a couple that I had helped them to secure financing to get their salon. They have a, a full service hair body nail salon and so I always go to them and it's a husband and wife team and the wife Angela is just I mean it's policy that no matter how many years you've been a stylist you will still go through the salons method of cut color blow dries and Last time I was there, Angela asked if I would mind if she used me as a model to show a haircut to one of her, her stylists that was new to the shop. Now, this woman was not new to styling, but she was new to the shop. Christ said, of course, I don't mind. And so Angela started doing the cut and explaining what she was doing to this woman. And I could tell from looking in the mirror that she didn't get it. Angela could tell. So they just kept going back over it. And I saw it, Angela saw it, when she had the aha moment. She was like, oh, I get what you're asking me to do. I get it. See, that's the benefit of hands-on training, is that the instructor can see when the participant gets it. Now, here's why that's so beneficial. Angela and Charlie run this salon, and no matter what I need done with my hair, I usually prefer to go to Angela and Charlie just so we can connect and catch up and visit with each other because they become friends. But if they're busy, I do not hesitate for one second to ask, well, who else is available? And I'll go with any of the stylists that have gone through Angela's training program because I know that she has not let them loose on her floor unless they have passed to her standard, which I know is pretty high. And that's, if you're looking for that consistency, that's the best way to get it. Looking at other training methods, one would be computer-based training. 
it's become increasingly prevalent, of course, as technology becomes more widespread and easy to use. And though traditional forms of training are not likely to be replaced completely by technology solutions, they will most likely continue to be enhanced by them. Human interaction will always remain a key component of workplace training. And it's a good idea to look more closely at what training technologies have to offer and how they might be used to supplement existing training programs or used to develop new ones. Uh, your computer-based training can vary from simple text-only programs to highly sophisticated multimedia programs, virtual reality. We'll look a little bit more in depth on those in this program. And then the online and e-learning, uh, in addition to computer-based training, Many companies with employees in a variety of locations across the country are relying on these other technologies to deliver the training. And according to the American Society of Training and Development, ASTD, which is the training industry leaders, the trade association, in their annual state of the industry report, companies are using and continue to use a record level of e-learning and ASTD predicts that that number will continue to rise. And again, it's because we're uh, located in different sites across the country and even the world. And e-learning can be a very effective way for learning to happen when you have a diverse and widespread work team. And in fact, I was able to get my master's through an e-learning program from the University of Houston. And it was the first of its kind in the nation to do a combined economic development and entrepreneurship program. And because of my speaking and training schedule, it worked so great to be able to travel and to still be able to access my classes online. And it was voted by Forbes magazine to be one of the top five programs for entrepreneurship in the nation. And it was an e-learning format. So when you're looking at the possibilities of what can happen through e-learning, it's limitless. Now with the e-learning, we still had access to the professors. So we still ha could do phone calls. If you were local to where they were, you could go in and visit with them one-on-one. -on -one. So we still had access to those experts. Uh, it didn't have to happen all online. And I think that was probably for me the most favorable part of it because it was so cool on my teams when we had to do different projects. I had people on my team that were all over the world. I had a couple people on my team who were serving in the military, and so they were in Iraq and different parts of the world, and then students were logging in, and so, of course, that's business. You know, we had to figure out what time zones people were in, how we could have meetings, and it was just such a great opportunity, and our professors were always available within reason, within scheduled times, to answer questions and to help us. And so as you're looking at e-learning, be sure to not remove the human element from it entirely. Still have the experts accessible to the employees so that they can answer questions and uh, give feedback on how things are going with the students. So when you're looking at this, this all comes down to some kind of, of taking these different styles of training that are out there and coming up with a blended learning approach that works for your workforce. And blended learning, all that it is, is simply acknowledging that one size doesn't fit all when it comes to training. And in a nutshell, and I'm guessing that you have probably found this to be true already, is that blended learning means using more than one training method to train on one subject. So when you look at training, do you think about, well, I've got this group to train, and it'd be best to use this method. I've got this other group. I'll use this other method. Well, you're using blended learning. It's as simple as that. And let me give you a few good reasons to include blended learning in your approach. A University of Texas study showed that a blended learning program reduced both the time and cost of training by more than 50%. That same study showed a 10% improved result in learning outcomes, which is one of the things that we're always looking for is how can we make sure we're getting the results. Well, using blended learning showed a 10% improved result compared with just one of the traditional methods. 
And then learning experts believe that a big advantage of blended learning is that it more closely replicates how people actually learn on the job through experience and interaction with coworkers. And that's how we get on the job training is we learn something, we maybe doesn't happen right the first time, maybe not the second time, maybe not the third time, but then eventually we learn and we have interaction with coworkers. Well, how does this work? How do I make that happen? This is what I keep running into. And so that blended learning style most closely replicates that style of learning. And the approach will work well for you also because the variety of approaches keeps the trainers and trainees engaged in training. Now, again, are you already using this method? And perhaps you haven't even realized that you're using it. Let me give you some examples. Have you ever used a PowerPoint training session and incorporated some written quizzes, some small group discussions, some role playing at various points in the training? Well, if you have, you've used a blended learning style. Perhaps you have taken a complex subject and broken it down into parts and then used a variety of different training methods to teach each of those smaller sections or steps. That's a blended learning approach. Or perhaps you've used a live trainer with hands-on demonstrations for the initial training, and then you came back with like a CD-ROM or some kind of online course or a webinar for the refresher training. That's a blended learning, and that can be very useful to help with the retention and the stickability of the training, making sure that it sticks. So if you've done any of those, you're already using a blended learning approach. So all of this as we're looking to move forward to how can we make sure that our training stays relevant? What are you doing to make sure that the training that you've been using for your boomers is also going to work for the X and Y generation, the workforce that you have coming in of this, these younger workers? And let's face it. There is a new generation of workers that are taking over key positions in your organization. And the generation is younger, but they're also different in ways that will definitely change how business and learning is accomplished. See, the way they spent their formative years has given them an entirely different set of skills from those who came before them. And those differences are driven by one central factor. And the difference is driven by the fact that they grew up playing video games. This gaming generation is soon going to outnumber their elders in the workplace. Their way of thinking will soon pass that tipping point and they'll become the standard operating procedure. So if you've been one of those like me, I'll admit I was in that category who was saying, hey, you know what? It's we're doing serious work here. We are serious people doing serious work. It's time to put the games down and get to work. Well, that's not going to work with this next generation. Sooner or later, those who grew up without video games will have to understand the gamers. That means not only learning what they're all about, but finding ways to redesign educational and training curriculum around their needs. Now, let me go back and slow it down and say it again. The traditional way of training that we're used to, there'll be a tipping point where it's no longer relevant. We can pretend that's not going to happen. We can say, well, they should come to our way. And just because we think they should doesn't mean they will. It's time for us to get proactive on it and realize that it's different, it will continue to be different, and there'll be more of the X and Y generation in the workplace than the baby boomers. And when that happens, it doesn't matter what we think should be, because we'll be outnumbered. And if we continue to stay in that mindset, what that means is you will no longer be relevant in the workforce. And I don't think you want that any more than I do. So it sounds unlikely, I mean, really, I mean, you, like many people, have probably overlooked, just like myself, just what a force video games have become. I mean, they're not just a niche anymore. Americans now spend more money on video games each year than they do going to the movies, and more time at home playing video games than watching rented movies. But to most 
people outside of the video game industry, games are still practically invisible. i got to say, I've never been a gamer. I've got kids who are gamers. I've got friends who are gamers. And I just kind of have ignored it. Most professionals like myself, like you, we know games exist, of course, but we still view them as just a child's toy or just childish play. But many of your coworkers and students have already spent billions of dollars and billions of hours in the virtual worlds created by these games. And a lot of their most precious childhood memories revolve around these games. I have three boys who are in their 20s now, and I can remember them out in the rec room playing games with their friends. It was this hours-long um, conquest and competition and challenges. And when they think about their childhood memories, that gaming is part of it. Games are powerful information technology. It's, they're unique in history. Never before have they had the influence that they're having now. And they're radically different from technologies that came before them, such as television. Television's not interactive. Games, with their powerful interactivity and reinforcement of particular behaviors, as opposed to the one-way delivery of television and radio and even someone lecturing, that has created an entirely new individual. And as a result, new and different needs for training have been developed also. So as you look into the research and the development of the brain, it shows that Early childhood and adolescence are the critical years for how the brain is prepared for perceiving and reacting to the world around it. And in fact, those critical years leave your brain with a particular set of assumptions and beliefs about how the world works. I looked at some data from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and it shows that 8 to 10-year-olds spend more than an hour a day with video games. And the immense amount of time spent with the games during these, this child's formative years has led them literally to be hardwired in a different way than those who came before them. The games reinforce certain beliefs about the self and about how the world should work and how people relate to one another and about competition and uh, collaboration and about the goals of life in general. Great. The games create a self-centered universe where the player is running the show and that player can manipulate other people and other objects to do their will. Now, of course, there's certain rules that go with the game on that, but it is very self-centered. The player is running the show. And research done by the North Star Leadership Group demonstrates that gamers show a range of different opinions and behaviors compared to their non-gamer co-workers. So, for example, instead of trying to seek one answer, games teach there are many potential paths to victory, and, and you should try as many as possible to see what happens. The gamers know that victory is possible. The game designer wouldn't have made a game that couldn't be won, couldn't be beat. So gamers will try different ways. If the first answer doesn't work, they'll try something else because victory is possible. Gamers are more likely to believe that winning is everything and that competition is the law of nature. And gamers believe that the world is a competitive place and standing still won't get you anywhere. So if you need results, you move forward. And if there's a fork in the road and you just take one and you see what happens. However, when you go down that road, you run into something along the way and it could either be a friend or it could be an obstacle. And it's up to you to try and figure out which one and what effect they'll have on you. So is this a friend or a foe? But gamers know you got to move forward to find out because standing still isn't going to get you to the next level. It's not going to get you the next badge. It's not going to get you the reward that you're looking for. And finally, games teach that being the hero is important. And this is so critical for us to understand. 
when we're looking at thought processes and how thoughts are hardwired into people's brains, when the gamers believe that people are counting on them to save the day and defeat the evil boss waiting for you at the end of the maze. So during the games, there's different levels, and each of that level has some kind of boss who controls that level, and it's your responsibility playing the game to defeat that evil boss. So the traditional leaders in top-down uh, management don't have a respect for gamers as they're taught the gamers don't respect them because they've been taught their entire lives to get rid of these authorities as soon as possible. <laughs> that kind of creates a problem, doesn't it? But see, that's how they think that, you know, they can figure it out and they can get rid of this authority that's, that's keeping them from getting where they, they are going. So it's one of those things that as we look at training and melding the workforce and taking the boomers and the X and the Y generation and making sure knowledge transfer happens and that great generation, great ideas from the younger generation gets uh, addressed and implemented, we have to understand that the thought processes are different. And this is where, after doing the research, I have to say that I had a complete 180 on the idea of games and the importance of gamification in the workplace. Because I'm sure like you, or many of you, that we're just thinking, hey, they need to do it our way. Our, our way is the one that's been proven. They need to move our direction. It's just not going to work that way. And when you look at this little graphic I have here, when you first see it, you see the word flop. And if you look at it again, you can see that if you look at the black background, what you see is the O in flop, you can see a white I. And now if you just read the outlines, the word becomes flip. And flip flop is the complete message. And once you find it, it seems so obvious, you wonder why you were blind to it in the first place. But it's just because we were looking at it the way we always look at it and we see flop. But once you change your perspective and expand your possibilities, you'll see something that you weren't able to see before. And that's what will happen when you're willing to be open to looking at things differently to see, well, what could we do differently to help make sure that this knowledge transfer is happening, that the skills that are necessary in today's marketplace with our current workforce, that we're providing that training, the skills that will be necessary in the workforce tomorrow, that we'll be able to adapt our training to meet their needs. If we can only look at this word and see the word flop, uh, chances are pretty good we'll be left behind because it will take a new perspective. It will take looking at the same thing and looking at it differently and being able to flip it to meet the needs of the marketplace and the workforce and what the organization is asking from you as a trainer, as a training and development expert, as a leading authority in your field, what you're being asked to deliver. So let's be willing, can we agree to agree that we'll keep our, our, our minds open to what possibilities exist out there that we hadn't even thought of before and what we can do differently to help make these changes happen. Now, when you look at corporations, organizations, the biggest challenge facing today's company is not a lack of technology or apps. During the past five years, companies have spent about $1 trillion on their websites, mobile applications, social media tools, document management systems, customer relationship management, and you name it, a whole other arsenal of technologies that have been aimed at increasing customer loyalty, improving employee performance, increasing employee and customer engagement. But the challenge has been a crippling lack of engagement with those investments. In fact, studies show that 50% of employees don't adopt the use of the enterprise software management that the company just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and endless hours of training. 50% of employees 
are still resisting the adoption of that software and using it. And 88% of employees don't use the social software that you have implemented as an organization if you have. As employees continue to fail to optimize the powerful tools at their fingertips, they underperform and fall out of alignment with the company goals. And a recent Gallup poll survey says that more than 70% of employees are not engaged with their jobs. More than 70%. 50% don't adopt the enterprise software and 88% don't use the social software. That's a lot of non-engagement. And meanwhile, the success of social networks and social gaming outside of organizations has demonstrated how behavioral psychology plays a factor in successful user experiences. Those sites and games have proven that people crave personal progress in building social connections and completing goals. And especially in the light of the fact that millions of people engage with these services without getting a dime of anything in return. They're not getting compensated for their engagement with it. And whether you play them or not, social games have never been more popular. Between 70 to 80 percent of mobile app downloads are games with hundreds of millions of users actively logged in and collectively engaged. Billions of minutes are played every day. In a recent 2011 study conducted by MTV, Jen Wires reported that a game-like metaphor applied to almost every aspect of their life. So anything that was going on in their life, you could make a game-life metaphor for it. More than half also reported that people my age see real life as a video game and that uh, pound winning is a slogan of my generation. So you'll see that world-class companies have begun applying some of these same proven addictive game mechanics in their employee training and engagement programs. They're taking some of the things that these successful social networks and social gaming sites and apps have learned and applying it to employee engagement, customer engagement, motivation, training, and we want to see how you can do the same thing and have some similar results. So whether you are a gamer or not, and like myself, I really haven't been involved in gaming, but I have friends that do. I have friends that do the words with friends. And in my seminar last week, a girl was doing a new one I hadn't seen before, and it was something like draw it. So you draw your make, you get a choice of words, and you draw it, and the other person has to guess it, the other people that are playing the game with you no matter where they are in the world and it was just another application that got people from all over involved together towards um, winning prizes and accolades and points and being recognized. So let's look at exactly what gamification is. Gamification is a buzzword used to describe systems that take elements of everyday games like chess or Donkey Kong and apply that to everyday life. So perhaps the best known example of gamification right now is Foursquare. It's that location-based social network in which people check in to places via their smartphone. And then when, once you check in, you're awarded badges for going out and experiencing new things. And the more frequently you go to a place, the higher your status. So, for example, you be, could become mayor of the place that you go to. And hopefully, potentially, that opens the door to discounts and other prizes. So my, my really good friend, Jonathan, uses Foursquare all the time, and he's got a local restaurant that he goes to in Las Vegas, and it's called, uh, well, I'll leave the name out, but he goes there all the time. In fact, he's mayor one week, but then because of his travel schedule, he's not the mayor the next week, and he will go twice in a day to check in so he can get his mayor status back. This is how important it is. Now, mind you, it's not like he gets a sash and a crown and recognition from anybody. It's just that level of competition. And the one thing that kind of started to go sour a little bit, though, was that the restaurant didn't actually recognize that Jonathan was the mayor. 
And by just adding some kind of discount or recognition, uh, it would have kept him so motivated to continue spending dollars there. And it kind of just fizzled out because although he, he got the recognition, there really wasn't anything that continued in that same vein uh, of public recognition from the restaurant owners. So when you're looking at gamification, you have to realize that people are motivated differently, and it's not just about badges and points. It's about what's the real socialness of this game? What's the real, what's the real elements that we're asking people to get involved with? And there's a gentleman named Gabe Zinkerman, and he is probably one of the most prominent advocates of gamification. His last name is Zickerman, Z-I-C-H-E-R-M-A-N. First name is Gabe, G-A-B-E. You can Google him. He's got great website, great tools for gamification, a couple excellent books. And this is how he defines gamification. Gamification is using game-based mechanics, aesthetics, and game thinking to engage people, motivate action, promote learning, and solve problems. So basically we're using the mechanics of a game, the aesthetics, the look and feel, and the thinking process of those who play games to engage people, that would be both employees and customers, motivate some kind of action, promote some learning, and solve problems. So let's look at a few characteristics. Now again, when I was doing the research, this is the kind of stuff that just fascinates me. Okay, here's a game, but we're serious people doing serious work. What are you talking to me about games for? We got stuff we got to get done. We've got important people, customers we've got to satisfy. Don't talk to me about games. But there are characteristics of games that can be used so effectively in the workplace to both engage, motivate, and train your employees. So let's look at what some of those are. The first is feedback. In a game, especially in, well, in any kind of game, whether you're playing a game of sorry or you're playing uh, a game of uh, words with friends, you have real-time feedback. Anytime you take an action, you receive instant feedback on how you did. Positive feedback reinforces the good behavior, strategies, tactics, while negative feedback enables you to learn quickly and make an adjustment. So when you lose your life, you start again and you try something different. You got the feedback right away. You didn't have to wait hours or days or weeks or months for someone to tell you how you did. You get it instantly. Well, how can we use that in the workplace? If you are still using the painful process of once a year performance reviews, it's just not going to cut it. In today's marketplace, we need systems and processes that enable fast and meaningful feedback so that we can accelerate our employees' growth and learning. And if you've got Y generation on your work team, you have to give them feedback consistently. Remember, it's been hardwired into their brains, not just from the video games they've been playing. They've also been getting it from their teachers and their parents their entire life. They've gotten a lot of feedback consistently, regularly. And in the workplace, we can't now say, hey, look, you're a grown-up now. Forget about that feedback. It ain't going to happen here. Well, if they're not getting feedback there, they'll go someplace where they will get feedback. And if they're smart and they're talented and they're creative and they're skilled and they're what you need in your workplace, then figure out how to give them some constructive and meaningful feedback on a regular basis. You'll see them just blossom in that environment. The next thing that you look at in gaming is that there's a transparency. Uh, games are like this statistical nirvana. Players can see exactly where they stand and where everyone else stands. They don't have to wait. The results are right there. Progress can be tracked and it's communicated in real time. And both here in the moment and then over a longer period of time, you can track and see how pe people have done. Well, what does that mean for you in the workplace? What that means is the number one question employees have is, how am I doing? That's the number one question they have. How am I doing? Did I do this project right? Did I turn the report in as you wanted? Did I give you what you were looking for? And they simply don't know. 
maybe they should know, but they don't. They don't understand how performance is being measured as a general rule, or their performance is being measured specifically, and how they measure up individually or relative to their peers. And again, in today's market, organization needs the ability to capture some kind of data and make it available to employees so that they can easily digest it and understand it and see how they're doing. And so we want to have something in place that will continually measure and track how employees are doing. The next really cool thing is the concept of leveling up. And in a game, you get badges when you do something well. Badges are indicators of specific accomplishments. Levels are used as a shorthand way of indicating long-term, sustained achievement and status. Reaching level 70 in the world of Warcraft means something to everyone who plays that game, which is that you have dedicated a certain amount of time and energy to the game and you've achieved a certain amount of skill. A level also serves to provide the player with intermediate goals, so they have a larger goal of winning the game, but they also have these short term, these small wins. And so in the long arc of playing uh, World of Warcraft, they have small wins along the way. And how can you apply that in the workforce? Well, studies predict, predict that Gen Yers will switch jobs frequently, holding far more jobs over the course of their lifetime than gener Generation X. And what does that mean to you? When they walk out your door, when they leave and go somewhere else to work, they're taking all the intellectual capital that they've built, that you've built, that you've built together, all of that's going with them. And in order to stop that trend, the Gen Y employees will need to be engaged in some kind of, of small wins and inter intermediate milestones along the way to this career because they view career differently. And there's got to be more ways for them in your workforce to earn status and respect among their peer group and others. And then the last one, and this is just fun for now as we, as we look at how you can use gaming is in the area of onboarding and mastery. So rarely when you're playing a game, you just get dropped into it with no instruction on how to play. And they don't simply say to you, well, have you read the manual? Read the manual. Games have mastered the process of onboarding users, teaching you how to play from within the game itself. Players get live experience at doing so, and they're coached by the system until they feel they have sufficient mastery to venture off on their own. So take the uh, game Farmville, Farmville, for example. It's a great example. And as simple as it looks, it has XP, farm coins, farm cash, ribbons, levels, planting, harvesting, and so many more areas. And if you were dropped into that game with just a plot of dirt, and nothing else, you'd have no idea what to do. But you don't just get dropped in. They hold your hand and teach you how to play by actually playing. And so in the workforce, you can use the onboarding and mastery techniques from games to drive employee adoption, adaptation, ongoing engagement, and increase employee performance and mastery, and you'll see the benefits in both employee engagement and the bottom line. So by using the techniques that are used in game to give that immediate feedback and learn as they play, do it, experience of doing it, you'll increase the uh, speed and the retention of the onboarding mastery. So those are just some examples of ways that you can use the game technologies, the game structures, the aesthetics, and bring them into your workforce for your, your employees. Now, let's look at uh, an example of gamification in the work workplace, and that uh, one that I pulled up because I thought we'd 
most would know who they are. It's, it's the organization of Deloitte. Deloitte's a large consulting firm and it has about 180,000 employees. So it's a big company. A lot of their employees are young. It's a consulting firm. So most of the collaboration that was going on within the organization was being done over email. However, the younger workforce was not getting that information and they were being left out of how they could do their job more efficiently. And so Deloitte adopted a social internet called Yammer as one of their networking tools. But the challenge wasn't finding Yammer or implementing Yammer. It was motivating the older workforce who had been using email for more than 20 years to begin using a new strategy to share documentation and engage with coworkers and to have knowledge transfer. And it didn't matter how much Yammer looked like Facebook, the boomers really weren't going for it. So Deloitte took a different approach and they asked them to sh simply share who they met with, what they discussed, and where it took place. And they put this real simple who, what, where mobile app, which, like a check-in system, it rewards consultants for checking in and sharing their information. And rewards are tied to expertise. So if you, as a consultant, check into four green tech companies, you'd receive something like the Green Tech Master Achievement. And then the rewards that are earned in who, what, and where are broadcast into the Deloitte's Jammer activity stream. And then those who have been reluctant to use Jammer and other tools see that their colleagues are being rewarded for their engagement. And that then puts some of that social pressure on them to start utilizing the new tools. And management would also reward it also by bringing recognition to it. Gamification uses are limitless. Many companies have begun gamifying their CRM systems, their learning management systems, back office systems. So for example, a back office employees who process support tickets. By using a gamifi gamification technique for the speed and accuracy of entering those, the workforce is mo more motivated to be engaged. Now, there is, of course, a segment in training, development, workforce engagement, customer relations that think gamification has no place in the workplace. So I wanted to make sure and bring that in and bring it to your attention so that we can make sure we're showing both sides of the discussion here. When most people think of gamification, they think of rewards, points, and achievements, and how artificially incentivizing people to do things based solely on rewards is a losing proposition. And it goes back to uh, 1937. B.F. Skinner, he proposed a system he called operant conditioning. And perhaps you may be familiar, I was a psych major and undergraduate, and junior year we had experimental psychology and we all had rats and we did experiments and they had to hit these little levers to release food pellets and when through his operant conditioning it reveals how the use of rewards and punishments because sometimes when they push that little lever they get a little shock it can also change human behavior and then in the 70s self-determination theory came out and it identified competence, relatedness, and autonomy as our basic fundamental human needs. Daniel Pink in 2009, his book Drive, that uh, bestsellers list for weeks, identified uh, a mastery of your area, sense of purpose, and autonomy as the three major motivators of today's workplace. And Pink argues that extrinsic trigger, triggers such as points and badges and rewards are actually demotivators in today's workforce. But let's look at it. Boy Scouts have been getting badges for reward achievement for close to a century. And if you've been in sales, you know that there's competitions and leaderboards and financial rewards for being the best at what you do. And for those of us who travel, if you travel a lot, I don't know if you're like me, I strategically align myself with 
uh, airlines and hotels and rental cars who have the best frequent flyer points because we get enhanced status and we get special offers and we get special privileges and those points add up and for myself who travels a lot I will pick a, the place where I get the most points and I will give my loyalty based on those points and the reward is that I this just this fall got to take two very nice trips that were based entirely on points so to me I, I'm motivated to do a good job in what I do in speaking and training that's a non-issue for me but when I'm picking my air my hotel I don't necessarily have a customer loyalty to one particular brand other than they have uh, good service and they provide me with awesome points and special offers and status. So when you're looking at the extrinsic intrinsic argument, the gentleman who is the founding father of gamification and he also is the founder of the company called Bunchball. I want you to go ahead and look up Bunchball. So that's B U N C H B A L L. They've got really great technology that you can use to incorporate gamification into any area of your organization. And Paria is his last name, P-A-H-A-R-I-A. -A -A. He's the founding father of gamification. And when he founded Bunchball, he realized that you could take the game mechanics that like we just talked about, that game designers have been using for years, such as the real-time feedback and competition and goal setting and apply them elsewhere. Outside of gaming, they still work to drive behavior because they're based on satisfying fundamental human needs and desires. And Margaret Robertson, who is a New York-based New York managing director of um, a company called Hide and Seek, says that games are engaging for many reasons. They have a dynamic structure in which things happen when you take actions. There's challenging goals and objectives, impediments, and a real risk of failure. Most things that are called gamification simply involve the use of points and badges and don't come close to constituting a game. A better name would be pointsification. So see, Margaret has a great point there. Her point is, is that games are about the challenges, the goals, the objectives, the impediments, the risk of failure. And it's not just about the points or the badges. It's, it's part of who we are as far as individuals wanting to take that risk and apply it in the workforce. There's also a company called Persuasive Games, and Ian Bogust is the co-founder of that company, and his idea is a little bit different. He says gamification is a marketing gimmick, and in one of his recent blog posts, you can look up his, his blog post, B-O-G-O-S-T is his name. His critique took one step further, and he described it as exploitationware, and even called it gamification bullshit, because he said it's invented by consultants as a means to capture the, he called it the wild coveted beast that is video games, and to domesticate it to use in the gray, hopeless wasteland of big business. <laughs> Well, that's a little bit severe, but his point is is that gamification or what or what a lot of people are promoting as gamification oversimplifies and Mr. understands what makes games powerful. He takes what he describes as a mysterious, magical, powerful medium and reduces it into something that is unrecognizable. And again, it comes back to is it just about the outside rewards, the extrinsic rewards? Many attempts to gamify situations are let down by people who do not understand games in the first place. The focus is on the obvious game mechanics such as point badges and leaderboards rather on the more subtle and more important game design elements such as the competition and collaboration. Extrinsic and intrinsic motivation are two completely different things and most people think that intrinsic motivation is undermined by extrinsic motivation. But here's the thing. I mean, if you look at somebody who runs a marathon or somebody who competes in the Olympics, 
Yeah, they want the medal when they're the first to cross the, the finish line. That's an in extrinsic motivator. But, you know, they have to do a lot of intrinsic motivation in order to get that medal. There is no way they're going through the hours of sacrifice, of training, of pain, of relationships, time, time away from friends and family and loved ones, just to get that medal. The medal is like the recognition that they did it, but it's about the intrinsic motivation of, I did it. Yes, I did it. So, yes, they're, they want the extrinsic, but it's about the intrinsic drive to get there. So what does all this mean to you? As you're looking at your training and development, you know, we definitely have not hit that tipping point where gamification has become part of corporate culture. My suggestion is that we don't ignore it. We don't pretend that it's not there. We research it as, as individuals, as professionals who lead training and development, who are responsible for it, to see, well, what have we been missing? What are we missing from the elements of games that would actually enhance and help our workforce and help to achieve those goals that have been given to us? And again, there will be a tipping point where there's more of the Y generation than of the baby boomers. And when that happens, it does not matter what we think training should look like. It will look a certain way. So how much better would it be for you as a training individual, as a training and development specialist, to be on the forefront of it, to do the research, to be on the cutting edge, to be able to have the peace of mind that you know that when these topics come up, you're not looking at it like, what, gamification? I've never heard that term before. I don't know what you're talking about. But one that you say, yeah, you know, I've done a lot of research on that, and it's, it's a fascinating topic. Here's what I find the pros are. Here are some of the cons to it. I, if we're going to add it, I think here's the things that we need to be concerned about. Here's the ways it will enhance and benefit. So be that leader that you are and be willing to explore that things will look different. You know, change is inevitable. Growth is optional. So change is going to come. Training is going to look different tomorrow than it looked today. It's your choice to choose to grow to see that you can fit into that new environment and to play by the new rules. Uh, in order to succeed, if you're going to include games, you'll have to create curriculum for your X and Y generation that uh, pretty much ignores any kind of formal instructions that People learn by doing and learn by collaboration. The training will have to lean heavily on trial and error, that failure is going to happen. Failure doesn't mean defeat. Failure means feedback. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try something new. Okay, that didn't work. What about if we try this? So we'll have to allow people to have the trial and error. There will be a lot of learning from peers, but virtually none from authority figures. That's a tough one, I know. But the, this next generation of X and Y want to learn from each other. We also need to design it that it can be learned in very small bits, so short pieces, when they want it, when they need it. And we have to allow for people to take a risk in a safe environment. We don't want to uh, penalize them for learning and allow them to achieve skill or talent that's meaningful. Gamers believe that the rewards come to those who take risks, and they'll strive more so than non-gamers to succeed as long as that goal has meaning to them. So bottom line is that young workers and managers alike believe that training would and could be more effective if it was more interactive like a game. Everybody believes that so that there's more interaction and input from everybody involved. And when you research and you talk to young workers, middle management, upper management, no one is saying in one direction that they prefer that it be a computer over a person. They just want it to be more interactive. So when you're thinking about your current training and if you're meeting the needs of your organization, are you doing interactive? Are you making sure that the level of threat is low, that 
you're able to connect with the audience, that the subject, the content, uh, the objective that they've all lined up. And here's the thing that I believe as a trainer is that it doesn't matter what your training. You can make that interactive and engaging for your participants. One of my favorite courses to develop, <laughs> I don't know that it was my favorite to deliver, but it was my favorite to develop, was a client who asked me to develop a payroll law class, six-hour class. I was going to deliver it 20 times for them. I, I really didn't want to do it. I didn't. I thought, you know, this is a kill me now class, payroll law. And I got together with a very, very creative trainer friend, a, a close friend, and she and I sat down and took the concept of payroll law and made it all about avoiding taking a bite out of the poison apple. We did a whole Snow White analogy. The woman you see on the screen was Snow White. We had games. We had uh, quizzes. And I had to present it to this company, the, their entire company at the home office, which was, I don't know, about 300 people and the entire C team. And, of course, I was nervous about the delivery of it because payroll law is serious people doing serious business. And here I am bringing crowns and jewels, and they had to compete to be able to glue the crowns, the jewels onto the crowns. And I can tell you by the end of the day, that C team was fighting to get those jewels glued onto their crowns. Now, you would think, wow. That seems kind of strange for such important people, but the competition, the collaboration, the idea of learning and being able to apply what they learn, that took over. The extrinsic of the crowns and the, and the rewards, that was just a reinforcement. It was just the fun part of it, of that, yeah, this is serious and we need to learn it, so how can we make it fun so we can learn it and remember it? And that's what makes training awesome. The fact that no matter what subject you've been asked to deliver, to get new skill sets to employees, is that you can take that, you have the ability to get outside the box, to think differently, and make your training awesome. I've been using the awesome training acronym since 2008, and you can modify it to fit your needs. I've modified it over the years somewhat based on training trends, but when you look at the acronym, the A is always for adapt your teaching style to the learning styles of the participants. Depending on who's in front of you, you want your style to meet them, not them to meet you. Wouldn't it be great if everyone would learn the way we want to teach them? But you know that doesn't happen, does it? So adapt your style to meet, meet theirs. The second one, and this is one of those that, especially if you're on that creative side, we forget to do this, but I encourage you strongly to write a logistic list. So make sure you've got that list that includes any kind of props or ancillary items or any manipulatives. Keep that list so that you don't have to remember what you have to take with you. And when you're going to go deliver that class or you're preparing for that class, just pull out the list and you'll be able to walk through that checklist and make sure you have everything you need so that you don't get stuck in the middle of your training and not have some kind of important item. So don't worry about remembering it. Just write, write it on a list, have a list, keep it with your training materials as you're getting prepared. Pull out your list and make sure you have everything you need. The E is to remember that every participant is different, and every participant has a different level of understanding, and they also have a different uh, emotional makeup uh, based on their experiences, perception of reality, how they've been treated by others in their life, others in the workplace, and be sure to try to prepare so that you understand that some people have real phobias. Now, Although classroom instruction is still the favorite form of instruction for boomers, the number one fear in that environment is that they'll look foolish in front of their peers. So we want to make sure that we don't have awkward situations where someone then uh, is hesitant to continue to contribute to the discussions. So just remember everyone's different. Sufficient time. 
you should do about 33% uh, physical activity, about 33% experiential learning, and 33% discussion, feedback, debrief. So break it down. My kind of rule of thumb is I don't want people sitting for too long. So no longer than 30 minutes without them at least standing up and moving and doing a, some kind of brief activity. And those can be, uh, I call my, sh my brief activities, illuminizers. The illuminizers can take under a minute. It just illumines, it brings light to what you're discussing. And that can fit into that physical exercise part and get them engaged and out of their seat. Make sure you need to leave enough time in any of your activities to debrief so they understand how it applied to them. O is you always have to have your objectives defined. Make sure you know the scope of the training and what objectives need to be achieved. When choosing activities, make sure that they line up with the outcome and that you don't just have an activities for an activity's sake. That's where games and activities get a really bad rap. That's why people make fun of trainers and their games because no one ever connected the dots for the participants that the reason we're doing this silly game is so that you can learn this and when you go back into the workplace you may not remember the three important steps but you'll remember this game and that's going to trigger the three important steps for you. So the objectives always have to be defined and tie the activity back to those objectives. The mood, M is for mood setting, always begin with a bang, statistic stories, videos, end with a bang, start team building, be well prepared. Rule of thumb is they got to learn something in the first 15 minutes that if they left there they felt like it was time well spent. And so make sure that you set the mood for learning. And this one's tough depending on who's in your room, but the last E is for everyone's equal in team building. It can be tough when you've got a variety of different levels of employees in training. Uh, when the C team or supervisors or managers are present, frontline employees, they'll tend to hold back. If it's a group activity, get everyone involved. You'll find that you'll just get amazing results and input and interaction when everyone understands that their idea is just as important as the person who is making a whole lot more money than them or being around the organization a lot longer or has a higher position in the organizational chart. So value everyone equally. So just to finish up, the question is simply what's holding you back? When you're looking at doing things differently, what kind of assessments have you done so that you make sure like for example, have you ever run the right program but you ran it for the wrong people? Or have you ever run the right program for the right people only to have them go back into workplace and find out that they either can't or won't use the new skills? Can't means that somehow we didn't connect the dots for them. Won't means that they don't want to make the change, which is not uncommon, but then we have to go back and revisit it. Or have you ever been in that situation where you felt that people wanted different training than what you were giving them or what they might need? And we may be good trainers, but if we conduct the perfect program for the wrong people, we've made some bad decisions. And if we run the perfect program for the right people, but we don't get the support from our organization, we're not going to get the results we need either. So when you're looking at your training and evaluating what you can do differently, the world of corporate training has definitely changed. You know that and I know that. What worked 20 years ago doesn't work well in the network, social, always connected environment. I'm sure you've probably found that you cannot build courses fast enough to keep up with the speed of change and that Internet's a great source of information for you. This We've gone from the industrial age through the information age, and now we're in the network era. And we want to see how we can make sure that we include collaborative work training systems into our organization. And most of that is based on trust. So when you're looking at 
your training program, you want to focus on helping high performers work smarter. You want to focus on making sure we don't punish people for things that don't work. Failure is not failure. Failure is feedback. So if you never fail, you're not innovating. So we want to make sure that we're designing things that people feel safe to try things, and if it didn't work, try something new. We definitely want people to narrate their work so they can document what they're doing, so we make sure that knowledge transfer can happen. You want to root out people who are not sharing that information. Sharing should be the norm. Uh, people that I call the black hole of information, do you have those? That information goes in and never comes out again? We want to make sure that they understand that we share information here, and that's how you get rewarded. That's part of the collaboration. And learning is a daily activity. Learning on the job is the most effective way to learn. Uh, trial and error can be slow, but trial and error can also be effective as we implement it immediately in the workplace. So you want to remove any obstacles that keep your organization from achieving the objectives that need to be achieved. And the last I want to encourage you is just to have some fun with it. Training and learning, it should be fun. Learning is fun. How much fun is it when you learn something new? When I learned the stats about the Y generation and how they're more willing to uh, take a risk, that they're less risk averse than the boomer generation, and when they don't, when they try something and it doesn't work, they're willing to try something new, and once they reach a level, they've got that, yay, I have this accomplishment, but then they turn around and they reach out their hand and they help the rest of their friends get to that level. They collaborate. They help others succeed. When I started studying and learning all this, I got so excited about how fun adding this whole concept of the game mechanics more into training so that it's okay to have fun, to be competitive, to collaborate, to try things and then try something else and then adapt and learn. And just make sure that, that you are that person that's in the crowd saying, how can we make this fun? How can we make this interactive? How can we make sure that people's time is time well spent, that they'll be able to take it and bring it back to the workplace? Uh, in the information that you'll receive with this webinar, you, me, anything that you would like to discuss, if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation, email me at monica at monicacornetti.com, and we'll see what we can get set up either by Skype or phone to talk about your organization and what you're running into and what you're encountering as far as some walls you're running into or some difficulties or would also love to hear your successes and your willingness to share those would be great for the rest of us. In addition, I am available to come to organizations and work with you one-on-one -on -one and we can discuss through the logistics of that. So I just want to encourage you to keep your training interactive. Keep it awesome. Be the leader that you are, the learner that you are, and then transfer that to the people that you uh, encounter, when they see your enthusiasm, they won't be able to help but being enthusiastic themselves. So thank you. I thank you for your time. And uh, go for it. And let's fix what's wrong with corporate training. Thanks, everyone.